when here's the legal history of how this all went down in the in the middle 60s it must have been around 67 uh somebody somewhere jumped out of a window on LSD and managed to kill themselves every newspaper in the country if not the planet did in-depth detailed background you know maps how he walked to the balcony the the arrow the whole thing and uh and LSD was legal at that time. So then there was a huge hue and cry about how it had to be made illegal. And by this was in California. And the California state legislature, with almost no debate, with no professional witnesses, with no scientific evidence placed before them, not only made LSD illegal, they made psilocybin, DMT, ibogaine, and figure this one out, bufotenin was made schedule one. Now get this, bufotenin is inactive in human beings. Why was it made schedule one? Because two weeks before this debate took place, a paper was published suggesting that it might cause hallucinations in human beings. In other words, they just went through the scientific literature and anything described as a hallucination uh, hallucinogen was poured in to this California drug bill. Well, and so then it was passed. Well, then six weeks later, somebody jumps out of a window somewhere else. This time, it's not even clear drugs are involved, but the mere suggestion that they might have been involved is enough to create a national debate, and the Congress, rather than hold hearings and adduce scientific evidence, says just take the California statute and federalize it. And so that was done. So there, what, what the consequences of this are is in the case of a drug, a substance like psilocybin, no scientific evidence has ever been offered to any legislative body saying there was anything wrong with it. It was specifically made illegal simply because it causes hallucinations. No health risk is involved. Nothing was known about psilocybin at that time. So that's the first attack on these laws. They were not properly formulated in the first place. Uh, they were not based on reality or social need. Second of all, DMT, it is now subsequently become known, is an ordinary constituent of human metabolism. How can you make possession of this substance illegal when every man, woman, and child on earth is holding? I mean, it's like the ultimate catch-22. We are all criminals all the time. Uh, they don't have to throw pot around your apartment. They can just draw blood from your good right arm and there's the damning evidence right there. So in the light of all this silliness, it would seem logical, I think, to go back and have a, a scientific review and a complete revision of the scheduling of these drugs. Look at the scheduling anyway. Schedule one, what is it? Compounds with absolutely no medical use whatsoever. Cannabis is in there, even though it's the preferred treatment for glaucoma, and for chemotherapy to suppress nausea in chemotherapy. Heroin is in there. And then all psychedelics. You move to Schedule 2, and the first thing that jumps out of you is cocaine is Schedule 2. Marijuana is considered to be a more dangerous and devastating drug than cocaine. Why? Because, by the rules of the game, cocaine is used in certain medical procedures to anesthetize the optic nerve sometimes and to anesthetize nerves in the throat for certain forms of surgery. So because it has this obscure medical use, it's Schedule two, And uh, this doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, these drug laws have never been rationally put in place. The original stigmatization of, of cannabis was carried on by the Hearst newspapers because they 
spent a huge amount of money buying Canadian forest for newsprint just as the hemp industry was beginning to develop as a supplier for paper. And when they realized that they had badly invested in Canadian timber, they decided that they would put the hemp industry out of business. And so they discovered that it's marijuana among those wily, dark-skinned folks south of the border who are so unclean and peculiar. And they began to attach it to a stigmatized racial group and, uh, and managed to hound it out of existence. This game has never been played fairly. It has always been played to benefit markets, capitalists, and uh, producers. Uh, it, it, it has never been handled in a rational and scientific manner. And we just simply need a rational uh, process that serves who? That serves the user, not the producer, the purveyor, or any, but it, these are medicines. They, they should be subject to, the, to the, uh, the same standards of purity and so forth that the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, what's always put against drugs is that they're unclean and dirty, but that's because they're made in illicit clandestine labs that have been forced underground by witless government policies. And now, you know, it's not even a matter of debate. We've got the Dutch data. We've got, we know that when you legalize drugs, people don't immediately start smoking reefer 24 hours a day and committing acts of public fornication. That hasn't happened anywhere. That's a fantasy of the Christian right wing. No, all that happens when you legalize drugs is that people continue to do what they've been doing, whether they use drugs or not. So uh, it's a shell game. And if any of you ever reach positions of policy making or, or influence on policy making, I hope that you will try to input into this process and, and rationalize it because it's one of the great unregulated scams on the planet. And millions and millions of people are being victimized. Third world poverty is being exacerbated. Criminal syndicalism is flourishing. Uh, ordinary law-abiding people are, are being criminalized. People are being made to feel guilty about simply trying to understand their own uh, spiritual yearnings and their own place in the cosmos. Uh, it, it, it's a, a, a tragic situation and it's retarding uh, cultural transformation.